Brandon Fertig, his documentary, The Wall, the stories of the 2018 Minneapolis homeless camp. Uh, the documentary is at St. Anthony Main Theater in Minneapolis this Thursday at 7 p.m. The documentary shares the stories of several people who lived in the Hiawatha homeless camp that sprang up last winter in Minneapolis. Many of the people he interviewed said they ended up there because they were seeking community and because of their shared problems, a collective sense of despair, and the inability to shake their addiction. Brandon, how are you? Hi, thanks for uh, having me on this morning. No problem at all. Um, you know, it's interesting looking at, I'm, I'm looking at a picture right now on uh, eventbrite.com of the, the homeless camp there. And, uh, you know, that, the one thing that just popped up, Brandon, I'll get this out of the way. I, I I hear young people saying, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be homeless for six months just to see what it feels like. I say, I, I have a problem with that, Brandon. These people, uh, some of them with, with, uh, mental illnesses, some of them with drug problems. I just don't think, I don't know. Am I wrong about that, Brandon? That people shouldn't be pretending to be homeless just so they can see what it feels like? I, I, is that kind of a, uh, a movement among young people these days? I, I do know that yeah. homelessness among the youth is, or young adults is rising. I, I saw a lot of it out west, which was actually the inspiration for this. Well, the, oh, okay. the camp here obviously was the inspiration for this movie, but my interest in the topic was inspired when I was out, out west, when I visited Portland, Seattle, Vancouver, and there's a lot right. of young people out there. And I just think a growing number of young people in America are saying, you know what? I'm kind of checking it out. I, 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 I don't want to try to get the nine to five. I don't want to try to get the degree i don't want to try to like just be an adult or you know do what i'm supposed to do i just want to check out maybe get high a lot of them do and it's it's easier to do that out in those western cities because of climate and and and, and friendly policy um but uh yeah if if you're just trying to an experiment i it it would be a little dangerous because um at, at this particular homeless camp that i did the documentary on uh, there's a lot of violence that happens at night. Um, and not to mention it would just be extremely unpleasant. I'll, I'll probably leave that to the undercover journalist or, you know, mm-hmm. someone like that to, uh, to do it or, you know, come to my documentary and find out what it's like living there with the people who, who, who told me themselves. You know, it's interesting, Brandon, because you look at all the layers of homelessness. People just going, oh, they're homeless. Okay, they're, you know, mm-hmm. well. One of the biggest problems we have is pharmaceutical companies in this country have to be reined in because uh, I don't know these politicians and these and these and the not all of them not, I'm not saying that but the availability of pharmaceuticals to people is just really gotten out of control and I know that people make a lot of money from but I don't know how you drive down the street and see a homeless camp and go hey man the company's doing well oh that's great that's nice yeah no it's uh that is a big problem, and 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 the sometimes people get hooked on the drugs that are mm-hmm. there to help you get off of uh, the narcotic, the, the illegal narcotics. So like uh, people can have problems with methadone and um, those those drugs, but um, you know, it, it's any consolation. The 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 documentary I did that community, I didn't see a lot of. Uh, pharmaceuticals. It was mostly oh, street drugs, heroin and meth that most mm-hmm. of the people there would abuse. Yeah, I just, Brandon, I, like everything else, I, I get kind of frustrated with the, how many, like I said, I, I refer to it as layers of, of the problem. Mm-hmm. Is anybody stepping up to help these people? Sure. There's a lot of people. Uh, yeah. A lot. In fact, I mean, you would be, sometimes I was surprised by how much was donated and there would just be tents and uh, food, um, gosh, like blankets and things like that. And then, of course, at the end of the tent city in December, it all had to just be thrown away. There, the, at this particular camp, it really got the community's attention, uh, you know, from the media and the politicians and, and churches, mm-hmm. and people were eager to help this particular camp. So it was well supplied. That's probably not the case for random small camps here and there that don't get the kind of attention this one did. And that was part of the appeal for why people wanted to live there. They, they knew there was power in numbers. Um, but honestly, to really help, I think, uh, you know, when you really boil it down, uh, 
and, and that was probably the most interesting thing I, I, I walked away from when I interviewed a lot of the people there is that, you know, uh, um, well, first off, from from a community standpoint, people tend to have one of two reactions. They tend to either, you know, they drive by and they see it, and they either think, "Oh my gosh, what a, what an incredible, what a pity," um, our, our society beats these people down. It's so terrible what you know what they're relegated to. And then person B might drive by and say, "Oh my gosh, get a job, you know, uh, get off the mm-hmm. drugs, you know, pull, you know, let, 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 let's get real here." And, and you have those two reactions. And when I visited the people there and interviewed them, I found out that there was a real, you know, there's, there's truth to both sides, right? I mean, the people there uh, did do drugs, uh, most of them, and uh, they did make choices that were harmful to their to their lives. But at the same time, then you learn about how they grew up. Maybe they were sexually abused as a kid. Right. Uh, they lived right. In, 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 in foster care. And, and then you, and then you, uh, build a great deal of empathy for them. And you realize that even though they make choices that you or I might not make, we didn't grow up the way they did. And so they do right. need support. They do need a great deal of empathy. And I, I think honestly, the, the biggest thing to help the people again that I, that I focused on at this particular community, it doesn't speak for all homelessness because, you know, there's veterans and there's, uh, there are people who just, you know, they get injured or there's people who lose their job or people who just can't afford where they live or, you know, there's a lot of reasons people become homeless. But in this particular camp, what I saw was a lot of pain, a lot of pain, a lot of um, uh, uh, a lack of believing in yourself, a lack of like a lot of self-worth. And if there's any kind of mentorship or, or counseling or, or, or something like that to help build the people back up, I think that's what's needed more than anything. Yeah, that would make sense. I, you know, I was going to ask you, Brandon, um, when I was a kid, like in the 60s, 70s, even in the halfway through the 80s, you didn't see a whole lot of homeless people back then. Where, you know, I know there were places like Souls mm-hmm. Harbor and, and Dorothy Day Center and, and places like that. Why the increase? I mean, there are more people on Earth, obviously, almost twice as many, as a matter of fact. Mm-hmm. So I understand that part of it, but, but, when did, when did the living on the street just blow up? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because my original idea for doing a documentary was to just do a, a, a general overview of homelessness in America. Like what happened uh, to suddenly have all these people uh, all right. who were homeless, uh, who were lost and, 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 and just decided to kind of check out of society. Um, I, I would soon realize that that was, I bit off more than I could chew, and when the Ten City here popped up, it was like, okay, this is a story just itself. So I did that movie. Um, but when when researching homelessness, I did find some very interesting things, like how in the fifties and sixties, the vast majority of homeless was white men, uh, and right. they're who yes. we now know as hobos. Uh, right. But that cu- that culture was starting to fade, uh, and it was it was it was fading fast. And so in the sixties. Social scientists actually predicted the end of homelessness, but then something happened in the 70s. And the, the, the best answer I can come up, come up with is just sort of an unraveling, um, which in some ways was beneficial, but in some ways was, in a lot of ways, was not. And, and by unraveling, I mean, I think a lot of people lost touch with community. A lot of people lost touch with uh, family structure, maybe their religion. Uh, there was a lot more... Um, you know, the late 60s obviously brought about a stronger acceptance of drug culture. And mm-hmm. I don't know, a, a lot of that seemed to contribute to where what we had in the 50s and before were a lot of tight communities, tight family units were no longer there. And interestingly, the communities that, that were hit hardest, well, maybe not interestingly, I mean, some people would say predictably, were the Native Americans and the African Americans who, before the 60s actually had lower rates of homelessness. Um, well, I, I shouldn't say that. I don't know that for sure. What I do know is that the vast majority of homeless people in the 60s and before were, were white men. And and then what happened in the 70s was something called the second wave of homelessness. And that's what we, what we know of homelessness today. And it's not just men, it's women too. And it's not just white people. It's, it's actually an over-representation of African Americans and Native Americans, as was very apparent uh, at this particular homeless camp that I did the documentary on. So something yeah. happened, I think, in, in American right. society so that a lot of these communities sort of unraveled. So there wasn't the support uh, that there used to be. When I've interviewed 
um, elderly Native Americans, elderly African Americans, about what life used to be like in their communities. It, they, they describe it as a as a tighter community, so that if there was a problem with one of the families, the others would come together and help. And it's not that they're any less, especially in a Native American community. They're they're still very close as a community, but um, I just think with drugs um, and 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 the um, the severity of the drug issue yeah. that. You know, families can't always reach out to help, uh, even if they try. Uh, so that the, the only thing you can do is, 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 you know, maybe tell a family member who's addicted that they can't stay in your house anymore. And so that has contributed to this great, you know, un- unraveling, which is sort of what I uh, theorized happened in the 60s and 70s, so that we have what we have today. But we really don't know what caused that unraveling. Mm-hmm. Um. Well, I think, you know, it, it seemed like in the 50s, we were in the post-war years, yeah, and yeah. people were just happy to have peace, and, and, and there was rising prosperity. But with prosperity also comes, I think, some discontent. Like, okay, so, so like the, the, the baby boomers came along, and they never really knew the warriors very well. Like, they, 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 they grew no. up um, in, in the 50s, and they only knew... Uh, a, a time of peace and rising prosperity. And so when they got to be of age in the 60s, I think a lot of them had the luxury of being able to point out the negatives in society. So then we had the unrest. So, and it, it's, not, it's not a bad thing, but, but, but the consequence of the unrest is, uh, uh, um, well, symptoms of, of the unrest were, uh, you know, free love, free, uh, you know, use drugs, um, mm-hmm. and, and, and the civil rights movement. And there was a lot of uh, anger and, and turmoil in society. And Vietnam was not supported, whereas World War II largely was supported. And even a lot of those vets didn't get support from, from the people back home as opposed to the World War II vets. And, it, it, you know, just the culture of America began to kind of unravel. And there was also a larger um, uh, cry for help from the government. So whereas, like I said, communities would, would help each other, say, in the 50s, 40s, and, 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 and before, now people were saying, hey, uh, the government should help the people more, and they did, uh, and and that's when we saw the, the the war on poverty from Lyndon Johnson in the sixties, and um, you know just just the rise of you know I, I use the term welfare state, but I don't I don't use it pejoratively, uh, oh, but yeah. there was a rise of 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 welfare and, and and helping people who were poor, and honestly I think that that did have a negative effect of um, of sort of um, displacing communities and families as the people there to help others and now we've got the government to do it for us that did i think unravel the community structure a little bit i just think the social evolution of the country uh the the fluidity of um of people to intermingle kind of broke down maybe the community structure a little bit especially along ethnic and religious uh, lines and religious religion became less of an important thing in people's lives some jobs were outsourced so that you know these yeah you're no longer going to have a career that pays you a pension at the end. Um, I, I just think global trade, the, 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 the developing economy, the rise of experimenting with drugs and, and questioning your religion. I think it's all natural and inevitable, but it does have this negative effect. I mean, you see communities that, that do stay tight and they don't have the same problems, uh, whether it be the Hmong community here in the Twin Cities. Mm-hmm. Um, or the Jewish community. I live in St. Louis Park, and 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 you just don't see the same kinds of um, uh, representation from those individuals uh, that are that are homeless and, and and on the street. Yeah, I don't think there's any question, Brad. I know we only have one more minute left, but but I'd like okay. to ask you the final question would be: um, Radio, television, and newspapers love to make money off of delivering bad news. I mean, it gets to the point, Brandon, where I've got a nice, solid family. I have a nice job. I got all this great stuff. But sometimes I go, oh, my God, I'm depressed just by watching the news mm-hmm. because the spin on the news, the, the more over the top you can be, the more money you're going to make because people want to tune in. It makes me feel terrible. I can't imagine what people who actually do have problems feel like watching and listening to that. Yeah, there's I mean. It's, it's been stated by some by some thought leaders today to you know and it's been said for a long time now to turn off the TV turn off the news uh, 
uh, unfortunately, social media has just amplified that. I mean, oh, if you go God. on Twitter, I, I challenge you to read the replies to any tweet that the president puts out, and you will oh, see uh, hate-filled tweet after hate-filled tweet. I mean, it, and those are the ones I like the most. It, 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 you know, it's like someone leaving a review for a restaurant. People are more likely to leave a negative review than a positive review. Really? Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think that that's true. I think they, they, they've seen that. I mean, people leave positive reviews too, but you know, you're more likely if you have a negative experience to go online and then write something negative about that experience than you are if you have good experience. Uh, it's not that you might, it, it's not that you won't necessarily leave a good review, but you're more likely uh, to to leave something if you walk away with a strong negative impression than with a strong positive impression. It um, is amazing. I just I just think that those reactive, angry, fear based emotions are shallow and and they're very readily available. Mm-hmm. And, and 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 they're fun doing not fun, but there there's something appealing about engaging with them. Whether it's whether it's eventing yourself or whether it's to read uh, people uh, uh, becoming angry and using a lot of insults and. Um, just, just bashing other things like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very, uh, accessible and, and, and Twitter especially is, is the worst platform for that. But, but a lot of social media has, has allowed that, uh, lot, allowed for that to flourish. And I mean, it, 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 to get back to this particular homeless camp, it, it gets back to this, uh, it, it gets people who live there hear this too, right? And, 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 and they, there, there's so much negativity in the camp, and there's not a lot of right. hope. And 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 they blame society. They they blame the government. Um, there's just a lot of negativity, and, and and there are groups that are there to promote. Hey, we can do better. We can do this. And I think that that's what these um, individuals need more than anything is empowerment. And so, you know, the the, the ticket sales or the donations actually, because tickets are based off of donations, pay what you can, and all the money goes to help uh, the people who are at the wall. Mm-hmm. Um, I am. I'm, I'm using this to help those who are trying to to build a better life for themselves. And 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 so when you come to the movie, uh, that's what your money will go toward as well. Um, and and so I hope to use this film for a, not just a tool of awareness, but also a way to raise a few dollars to help those who who do want to build a better life for themselves. Uh, the first two showings were sold out. We have one more this Thursday at 7 o'clock at the St. Anthony Main Theater. You can get tickets by either going to uh, mspfilmsociety.org uh, uh, or you can go to my website, theperiphery.com, and there are links to get tickets at both of those places. If anyone has any questions, email me at brandon at theperiphery.com. Fantastic. And we'll put that on our website. As a matter of fact, Brandon, I got one mm-hmm. warning to you. You're, you're a, you're a nice man and you're very even keel. You're going to, you're going to ruin your life if you're so happy. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> no, I like your take on it, Brandon. You, you're just very even keel. There, you know, maybe you went through an angry period, but that's gone. And I think that's only going to help that you're, you're so even keel about it. And you no, know, you are. You're a really decent guy. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely, sir. Brandon Fertig, ladies and gentlemen.